I thought today I would give you a bit of an overview of some of the work that we're doing on non-coding RNAs, particularly riboswitches. And I'll give you a sense of some of the um, recent riboswitch classes that we've discovered. And then towards the end, uh, give you um, a, sort of a map on how we're going to find lots more wonderful non-coding RNAs, which we think are out there by the thousands. All right. So. Um, First of all, I want to give you a sense of the challenge that we have in discovering non-coding RNAs. So on this slide are shown three uh, uh, highly functional non-coding RNAs. The one on the left is the ribosome. This is actually just the 16S ribosome with a few proteins that are colored in purple. Uh, so this is a very large RNA, about 1,600 nucleotides. Every cell has at least one uh, copy of the gene for this RNA. Of course, if you want to find the whole ribosome, there's another uh, large, about uh, the twice as large uh, RNA uh, that make up the, the multi-component ribosome uh, system. These are quite easy to find. Big chunks of the genome are used to code for these uh, or to, to uh, they function as genes for these non-coding RNAs. Uh, and so it's quite easy to design a computer algorithm that will find ribosomes. Uh, a similar thing can be said for RNAsP. This is a smaller RNA. It's about 400 to 500 nucleotides in length in, in most bacterial species. Most species, it's, it's very rare to find a bacterial uh, organism that does not have an RNAsP uh, RNA. Uh, this RNA is a ribozyme. It catalyzes RNA hydrolysis. And again, very easy to design a computer algorithm that will find a very big non-coding RNA in the genome of almost any species. Uh, the ones that are very hard to find, but I think no less uh, interesting, are riboswitches. So this shows an example of what is a 34 nucleotide RNA that folds up and forms a selective binding pocket that binds the modified nucleotide called pre-Q1, pre-QCene 1. So this thing is a riboswitch. It's going to bind that small molecule and uh, control gene expression. And uh, riboswitches are almost always uh, found in the five prime untranslated region of messenger RNAs. So if we spot a highly conserved, highly structured RNA sitting in the five prime untranslated region of a gene, there's a pretty good chance that that RNA is probably regulating the downstream gene. And there's all sorts of mechanisms by which these RNAs uh, uh, function. But they all have two basic components. An aptamer domain, that's the highly structured part that's binding the small molecule, so that's apt to bind some small target. And what we call an expression platform. It's an additional structure that changes its shape when the metabolite or, or ligand binds. And that controls gene expression by any number of mechanisms. I'll show you a couple of examples of mechanisms in the slides uh, today. All right, so uh, I mentioned pre-Q1 riboswitches. There are actually three major flavors of these riboswitches that we've found uh, uh, to this point. And on this cartoon, uh, I'm showing you here, this is what we call class 1 pre-Q uh, riboswitches. Uh, here's type 1. There are actually three different flavors of this one class of, of uh, pre-Q1 sensing uh, riboswitches. Here's the compound. It's a modified uh, guanine residue. It's missing the N7. It's got a carbon in place of N7. And this little alkyl, this little methylamine uh, attachment uh, off of that 7 position. So uh, in each case in this cartoon, you'll see a number. That's the number of examples of that riboswitch class we have in about 1,000 bacterial species that have been uh, sequenced. Uh, uh, type 2s are a little bit more rare. They all have the same general architecture. But there are different conserved bases. So you can see the red nucleotides are highly conserved. There's some positions in these that are different uh, between the different types. Uh, there's about 500 of these, and there's about uh, almost 300 of these. Uh, uh, an example that's been crystallized forms this highly structured, uh, um, very compact RNA um, uh, structure where the ligand is uh, docked in between these two uh, stretches of, of the aptamer. And this binding interaction is going to be mediated by all the forces that you would expect an RNA could generate. Hydrogen bonding interactions, for example, van der Waals interactions, um, uh, ionic interactions between the phosphate and metal ions and the ligand, et cetera. Now, there are actually two other flavors of this RNA, uh, uh, pre-Q1 class 2 and pre-Q1 class 3. Uh, all of these now have uh, uh, crystal structures for. And they're all distinct architectures, different ways that biology has found to fold RNA to bind the same uh, molecule. OK, so we would like to find more of these. Um, and the reason is that if we, in this case, we've divided up the bacterial uh, uh, um, 
branch of the tree of life into 36 different divisions. And then if you see these circles here, the larger circle, the largest uh, circles here indicate that there are riboswitches of uh, that type, class one, for example, here, um, uh, present in, in certain divisions of life. And the size of the circle indicates how common they are. So the largest circle is one riboswitch for approximately every one million base pairs in the genome. The smallest circle is about one riboswitch for every billion base pairs in the genome of those of organisms in that uh, lineage. Now you'll notice that there are some divisions uh, that don't have a pre-Q1 riboswitch. So either they don't care about measuring pre-Q1, although many of those species have the compound, so they might use proteins, or they have riboswitch classes that remain undiscovered. And we would love to discover all of them that exist, not only for uh, that sense this compound, but for many other compounds as well. So how are we going to do this? Well, our typical approach to finding novel non-coding RNAs, including riboswitches, is to look for gaps in the genome that don't code for proteins. It's as simple as that. We're looking for non-coding stretches, particularly long ones. Uh, and then what we'll, we'll use, we'll use computer algorithms that search through this to identify highly conserved stretches of sequences between that intergenic region and all other intergenic regions that we can identify in these bacteria. And we look for conserved uh, secondary structure. So that's an indication that we have a highly conserved, highly structured RNA that might function as a riboswitch. So what do we find when we use those computer algorithms? We find many hundreds of novel RNA structures. Um, and they have many functions. Uh, very commonly, we're finding riboswitches. We found a few new ribozymes. I won't talk about those today. Uh, and a number of other small uh, non-coding RNAs. And a few that we believe are uh, binding sites for proteins. And I'll give you examples of some of these. Um, in rare instances, we find big non-coding RNAs of unknown function. Uh, and sometimes the intergenic region is really not a non-coding region. There's actually a coding region there. Either it codes for a short protein or it's just a misannotated gene that, that has a longer you know, uh, C terminus or N terminus than what's been annotated. All right, so here's some examples of what we find. This RNA, we believe, is a protein binding uh, domain. Uh, just to orient you here again, the red nucleotides are highly conserved. 97% or greater of the examples have those nucleotides at those positions. Green shading indicates covariation. If one side mutates, the other one mutates to always retain base pairing. We think that's a protein binder because the sequences in this loop are very much the same as the sequences in that loop. This looks like a perfect landing pad for a protein dimer, some gene control factor, to bind and regulate gene expression. And we tend to ignore these elements. We'll, we'll identify them. We, we show their shapes. We name them. Uh, but we tend not to, to do experimental validation on them. We're looking for RNAs like this that might be riboswitches. I'll tell you probably more than you want to know about that RNA in a moment. And in rare instances, we find big non-coders. So what does a big non-coder look like? Well, I made this slide to be a little bit uh, tricky. That is a big non-coding RNA. We don't find many of these things, although we have, uh, I think we have several um, hundred examples of this RNA in many bacterial species. Organisms that are, uh, you know, live in the ocean all the way to organisms that are present in yogurt. Uh, we don't know what the function of that RNA is. Very commonly we find it as a gene in a bacterium. Clearly it's important for, the, for bacterial survival. But about half the time we find it, it's part of phage genomes. And so we think that, in this case, phages also can make use of the function of this RNA. Again, we don't know um, um, at all what the function is. All right, so let's get back to RNAs that we can solve, even if sometimes they're very difficult. So this is, these are three examples of riboswitches. And we, for a while, called these orphan riboswitches. We knew that they were riboswitches. We just didn't know what the ligands were. So we had to figure this out. So I'm going to tell you about PIFL, CRCB, and uh, an RNA that we just uh, uh, worked on called YJDF. So let's take a look at PIFL. Now imagine that you're finding these RNAs and you think they're riboswitches. There's a little set of questions that you would ask yourself to try to determine what the ligand is. What is the RNA sensing? So in this case, we said, what are the genes associated with the PIFL RNA? And they're very commonly genes that are controlling uh, folate metabolism. So here's the folate uh, cycle. This uh, line of reactions here is uh, the production of purines, and then on the far left is the production of histidine. So the, the lines in red are very, the genes there are very commonly controlled by this riboswitch class. And notice how these two paths talk to each other. This folate cycle talks to uh, the purine pathway. 
And so we had speculated that given that we know where all the atoms come from in a purine ring, we speculated that if you're starved for folate, you might not be able to complete the formation of either this five or six membered ring of purine. And since genes that were controlled were most commonly routed towards this second part, the closing of the ring there, we believe that perhaps the buildup of ICAR, this compound shown here, might be the ligand for the riboswitch. So if you don't have enough folate, or particularly uh, 10 formal tetrahydrofolate, this compound should build up. So that was our best guess for this riboswitch ligand. Now we had another big help with this riboswitch, and that was a paper by Barry Bachner and Bruce Ames more than 30 years ago. It's a paper published in Cell where they claimed that cells that were starved for folate would build up a compound they called ZTP, which is simply ICAR or, or ZMP plus two phosphates. So they were monitoring this by using radioactive tracers and found that ZTP built up when you starve cells for folate. All right, so we did all sorts of experiments, genetic, biochemical, binding experiments, et cetera. I won't show you all that. I'll just show you this one example here where we have the riboswitch here with its expression platform. There's a strong stem followed by a run of U's. That's going to act as a transcriptional terminator stem. And we think that this stem should be disrupted when the ligand binds because we have to form a pseudonaut between this bulge here and part to the left shoulder of that terminator. And sure enough, if you transcribe this RNA in the test tube, Without ZTP, you'll get strong termination unless you dial in increasing concentrations of ZTP and then you get read through. So this is the riboswitch telling the system to shut off expression of that gene unless ZTP is building up to high concentrations. All right, now this is an RNA that is amazingly good at discriminating against compounds like ATP, but it actually doesn't care about the phosphate because Z, uh, ZMP or even Z, the dephosphorylated version, all seem to work just fine. They bind fine, et cetera. It's if, if that closed ring system builds up, you'll get uh, gene uh, activation. Now, there's all sorts of things you can do with this other than just to learn about the biology of how biology regulates folate metabolism and purine metabolism. Uh, and in this example, we're doing a very simple thing. We're simply hooking the riboswitch up to a reporter gene. We're putting this in E. coli. We make lawns of, of E. coli on bacterial plates. And in the center of each one of these plates is a little paper filter disc. And on that disc, we're dropping different types of antibiotics on these nine uh, Petri dishes. And you'll notice that the first three, uh, for example, this is trimethoprim, this is methotrexate. These are all antibiotics that kill uh, bacterial cells by starving the cell for folate. They inhibit folate metabolism. And notice you have a, there should be a dead zone around each one of those rings. But when the cells are barely alive, you see a blue halo. That's the riboswitch telling the cell, you don't have enough folate because I detect ZTP. These other six uh, um, plates um, are antibiotics. They're killing uh, the cells too, but they don't induce folate. They're not known to work by folate mechanism, and so you see no blue halo. So one could imagine then using this riboswitch as a tool to screen for novel antibiotics that hit folate metabolism, which is one of the four major ways in which modern uh, antibiotics function. All right, so let's go on to CRCB. I'm going to show you this one very quickly. It's the strangest riboswitch we've found so far, but just by a little bit. All right, so again, let's play the game. Here are the 12 most common genes controlled by that riboswitch. CRCB, the most common gene, unknown function, an anti-porter. These, are, uh, this protein class here, is a, uh, they're very well-established chloride channels. But of course, you wouldn't think that RNA is going to selectively bind chloride so we, we, we didn't even consider that as a possibility. Uh, and then a few other genes. In other words, we didn't, we didn't get very many clues at all as to what the ligand might be for this riboswitch. So we simply started guessing. We had a few wild guesses. I won't tell you about why we were making those guesses. But we found that if we bought a, a compounds from a particular company, the switch always switched. And when we bought those same compounds from a different company, they didn't switch. Uh, and so we knew right away there was a contamination in the sample. We just had to track down that contamination. And the contamination, again, I'm sparing you a lot of data, but the contamination was fluoride. So here's the a reporter gene expression. We're titrating in fluoride concentrations. And you get huge gene expression as you reach, uh, in this case, millimolar amounts of fluoride in the exterior uh, of the cell. So unknown how much actually gets in. 
So we, again, did a lot of experiments to convince us that fluoride indeed was being bound very selectively and with reasonable uh, affinity. Um, and this was the uh, data that convinced us that fluoride was the natural ligand. Um, this organism, Methylobacterium ex torquens, has 10 of these riboswitches when most bacterial cells have one or maybe two of these riboswitches. So we knew there was something special about this organism that would tell us what the ligand is. And that special characteristic was that this organism eats halogenated hydrocarbons for food. So it's chipping fluoride off of fluorinated compounds. And fluoride is toxic. The cells then detect elevated amounts of fluoride and then have a whole series of genes they activate to overcome fluoride toxicity. Um, I won't toggle back to the slide, but many of the genes that we see controlled by this riboswitch, we now recognize as specific mechanisms, proteins, to overcome fluoride toxicity. In other words, two of the top three most common genes there are actually very specialized fluoride transporters that simply eject fluoride from the cell. So you have to ask why can RNA or how can RNA bind fluoride? Well, here's an example. This is an RNA that was crystallized by Dinshaw Patel's lab. You can see the the work here, um, that RNA folds into this complex shape and brings two regions of the RNA, two uh, uh, regions of the phosphodiester chain really close together. There's five phosphates that actually come closer together than they should be allowed to. And how do they come so close together? So the yellows here are the phosphates, the, uh, or phosphorus, the, the purple or pink here are oxygens. They come together really close because it, they, they bind three divalent metal ions. So there's six positive charges from the magnesium triangle, five negative charges from the phosphates, and you're missing a negative charge, and that's the fluoride stuffed right in the middle of that triangle. It's the only thing that will fit inside there. It's just too small to sense anything else. So that's how biology is sensing fluoride and controlling all sorts of genes that overcome fluoride toxicity. Here's another RNA, YJDF. Usually we call these RNAs after the gene that they most commonly associate with. And if it's a Y gene, that means that uh, researchers don't know what the function of that protein is that's produced by that gene. And we had a very particular problem here uh, in that this riboswitch, if you look at the genes associated with this riboswitch, almost without exception, they're this YJDF gene and we don't know what that protein does. So we're really stuck. But again, we decided to just take some wild guesses so we're throwing compounds at a, a, a reporter screen and some binding assays. But we also created a, a reporter system and then screened a small chemical library, maybe about 500 compounds. And from both approaches, we got lots of hits. And that was a problem, that this RNA seemed to be way too sloppy. For example, the best compound that we found that worked is this compound called chelerythrin. All right, so here's the conserved RNA. Here is an RNA from Bacillus subtilis. We can put a radioactive tag on the 5' prime end, and we can do a binding assay where we watch the RNA fall apart. And here we're adding in the ligand. And as this banding pattern changes, that gives us an indication that the compound is binding to the RNA and that the RNA is changing shape in this process. So we have very good evidence that this is a one-to-one -one interaction. This is, it looks like an interpolator. This looks like something that would just randomly slot into nucleic acids. We know that that's not the case because we would get a very different a banding pattern that was just a mess and not these precise changes. Also note that all these changes are occurring, uh, these red shaded areas here, they're occurring in the conserved parts of the RNA up here. So here are binding assays. This is for uh, chelerythrin. We get a classic one-to-one -one interaction. KD is 2.5 nanomolar. A similar compound here gives us very similar results. But even distantly related compounds, we're calling all these things aza aromatics because they have these nitrogen um, ring structure, so they're usually planar, greasy, nitrogen-containing rings. Many different uh, versions of these work, many, many different versions. This is so unusual. Most riboswitches are incredibly selective for the ligand that they bind. This one is a mess. All right, so we know this, these, some of these compounds, at least, the ones that bind the best, actually control gene expression uh, in cells. So here's the riboswitch aptamer. We know the expression platform is that there's some nucleotides here that will base pair and hide the ribosome binding site, uh, and that will control gene expression downstream. And so our, our speculation is that if the ligand is bound, it will disrupt this long pairing interaction here and turn on gene expression. So we're adding various compounds, storosporin here, chemical structures here, seems to work the best on this plate. But again, we have a lawn of bacteria. We drop the compound on the filter disk. If the if it turns blue, we know the gene is being turned on. 
And we've taken some of our better performers here. Many of these compounds will turn on gene expression. Uh, and so the problem that we have, though, is we don't know what the natural ligand is. We think that the natural ligand might be amongst uh, a collection of azo aromatics, but we don't know precisely what nature, uh, what molecule nature particularly cares about. We don't think it's the compounds that we're testing here. And the reason is, is that in these, in these uh, uh, cells, we've knocked out that protein, the, the YJDF protein. And although many of these compounds here are toxic, their toxicity doesn't increase and gene expression doesn't increase meaning that at least YJDF protein doesn't detoxify these greasy planar compounds. All right, so why do we think that this at least might be partly uh, correct? So in this case, this pie chart here, we're not looking at the gene downstream that's controlled by the riboswitch. We're looking at what genetic element resides upstream of the protein. So not all of the proteins, not all the protein coding genes are associated with the riboswitch. Sometimes they're associated with other things. So the vast majority are associated with the YJDF riboswitch, right? But the second most common thing that this protein coding gene is associated with is uh, a gene called PADR, which makes this protein uh, class of, of protein regulators called PADR. Well, PADRs are famous. They're famous for binding greasy planar things and turning on gene expression, right? So. Uh, it appears as though, in this case, that the riboswitch is trying desperately to act like a protein that has evolved to recognize a broad spectrum of greasy, planar, and usually toxic compounds. So again, we don't know what the natural ligand is, but we're pretty confident that azo aromatics probably would describe the nature of the, com the natural compounds once, once it's found. All right, so here's um, the, a summary of the collection of known uh, uh, riboswitches that we have so far. I've only described a few of them. And this plot shows on, the, on one axis here um, the name of the ligand that's bound by the riboswitch class. And then on the y-axis is the number of copies of that riboswitch, in a, again, in about 1,000 or so uh, sequenced bacterial species. So the most common riboswitch, thiamine pyrophosphate. Second most common is a, a riboswitch for coenzyme B12, s methionine, et cetera. And you'll notice that there, as, as you get more and more riboswitches, these are uh, in rank order based on how many there are in biology. And you'll notice that there's an ever increasing number of ever more rare riboswitches. And when you get down to below 300, we put it in this inset. So again, the, the population keeps on tailing out. And whenever you can make an inset of an inset, you should make it. And so here, anybody less than 15 um, is present here. Now, so what this tells us, a couple of things. One, we think there are many, many hundreds or even thousands of classes of riboswitches to find. The other thing um, I've, uh, I should note is that if it's an open bar, we don't know what the ligand is. These remain orphan riboswitches. But everybody that's listed in red was an orphan riboswitch at one time. And it's when we figured out what the ligand is, it teaches us amazing things about, uh, about the, the, the switches so, uh, or about biology. These are very common second messengers, uh, cyclic di-GMP, cyclic di-AMP. Uh, uh, there's a, a ligand here. This one here was not even discovered when we found the, the, the riboswitch class. Uh, and so we want to solve these open boxes because it, we'll think we're going to learn a lot more about biology as, as we um, establish those ligands. So how are we going to find more? So the problem now is that riboswitches are becoming so rare that our computer algorithms are getting confused with just noise, just accidentally. There's some conserve, appears to be conserved sequence and structure, but it's actually just, just uh, you know, noise in the system. So we're having trouble. So this approach that I'm showing you here is going to overcome that problem. So what we're doing here is we're plotting uh, intergenic region size versus the GC content. And it turns out that many bacteria are quite GC poor in their genomes. But they have intergenic regions that are amazingly GC rich. And that's because they are forming three-dimensionally folded RNA structures that have special functions. And you'll notice every, every one of these spots here that has some color to it or shape, those are known non-coding RNAs in this particular species. It doesn't matter what organism it is. This is an alpha proteobacterium. Um, so what we want to do then is look in these genomes for spots, they're, they're very faint gray triangles. You'll see those are examples where there's an intergenic region of some considerable size and GC content, uh, but there's no known structured RNA there. 
So we're going to find interesting things here. And so what we do, I'm going to be toggle here. You can't see this probably in the back, but if you toggle back and forth, you'll see some of those gray triangles disappear. Those are actually coding regions that the annotators simply missed, right? So they appear to be non-coding, but they're actually coding for proteins. So we have about seven unknowns in that quadrant that looks like uh, where the non-coding RNAs would hang out. So here is candidate number one. A little bit of structure, not much sequence conservation, but we have 450 examples. And the gene associations suggest that it's not controlling the downstream gene, that this is probably a free-floating non-coding RNA. And we believe this is a short RNA, uh, and we're going to call this sRNA-1. Here's candidate number two. The structure here is probably from the terminator stem that comes from the gene upstream. And it has, so we have 290 examples. But we spot a pattern that screams that this is an upstream open reading frame. Every third um, uh, uh, nucleotide in this series varies. That's what you'd expect for the wobble um, uh, position of any codon. So we think that this is an upstream open reading frame. We're going to call it UORF1. Candidate 3. This is a classic signature of a protein binder. A sequence here is similar to a sequence here. It looks like a nice landing pad for a protein dimer. But you'll notice here that I don't have U's in this structure. I have T's. And that's because the gene association is always a DNA recombination protein uh, that is predicted to cut single-stranded DNA. So we actually think this is not a non-coding RNA. This is a structured DNA. Candidate 4, we think, also is a protein binding element. I won't dwell on that. And then we have candidates that we think so little of that we don't name them, at least not formally. We're not bold enough to put them in a category, a functional category. So we name them either low, medium, or high ranking candidates. And there's various reasons why these rank lower. Some of them have wonderful structures, uh, but we don't have any good clue as to what they might do. And candidate 7 here, poor thing, only has two unique examples in all microbes that have been sequenced. And so we call this a low ranking candidate. All right, we've now looked at only three genomes. We have well over 1,000 sequence genomes to go. Um, we've only looked at three. But here's our first riboswitch candidate, something we call Thiass, highly structured, always positioned in front of thiamine metabolism genes. And it very commonly occurs upstream, or, or I shouldn't say upstream, I said in tandem with thiamine pyrophosphate sensing riboswitches. So we think that that's a, a, a riboswitch, and we now have to go out and experimentally prove that. All right, so to conclude, we think that informatics methods of whatever flavor will continue to yield many non-coding RNAs, some with functions that we can understand quite easily, some that will be very, very difficult to, to uh, uh, evaluate and validate. Um, in rare instances, we're going to find some novel ribozymes and even some big non-coders. We're very eager to solve the functions of some of these big non-coding RNAs. Um, uh, again, some of them resist uh, uh, classification. And, and we're going to have trouble uh, validating them. And um, regardless, even, no matter how hard this is, we're going to learn a lot about RNA biochemistry and about uh, the biochemistry of many microbial organisms. I will stop there. I need to highlight a few people who've done the work. Zasha Weinberg, I need to point out, has done a lot of the informatics that gave, us, gave rise to so many of these wonderful orphan uh, riboswitches that we're now studying. Um, Shira Stav, right here, is now working on fully annotating these genomes for non-coding RNAs. Uh, Peter Kim and James Nelson worked on the ZTP uh, riboswitch, and Sanchu Lee worked on the Aza aromatic riboswitch. And I think I will stop there. Thank you very much.